Welcome to Conversations. I'm Scott Turner, and our guest today is Paul Bardunias. Paul is an entomologist from University of Florida, and Paul, you have an interesting mix of disciplines. You study social insects, but you also have an interest in uh, culture and uh, tactics of warfare of, of ancient Greece. So, how's that happen? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, at an early age, was exposed to the ancient Greek culture through my father. My family comes from Sparta originally. And you know, as immigrants in America, we lost the language. <clears throat> we were not Greek Orthodox. And one of the things that he held on to were, was the history. So he passed that on to us. Um, my interest in insects was I always uh, blame my mother because I told her throughout her life that she could never keep the ants out of the house. So I always had something to play with and uh, became fascinated by, by these little creatures. And so, how does history come into this? I mean, you know, ant, ants and and uh, ants and Greek warfare. I mean, what's the connection? Well, the the connection is that I study um, group behavior in insects. How bunches of insects come together and uh, do a process to build a structure or to excavate tunnels. In my uh, experience, um, the way that's done is through self-organization. So. They're organized at a very basic level. Interactions between individual ants or termites or bees or whatever it is um, come together as an aggregate to produce a bigger structure. But the rules of, of uh, building are unknown to any individual. It's just local interactions between individuals. And when I started to learn more about ancient Greece and get into the, the literature on Greek warfare and looking at warfare in general, I realized that the same thing is occurring on the battlefields. We spend as humans a lot of energy, a lot of mental energy, trying to harness our, our chaos and make order. <clears throat> and that's from the top down. So we build blueprints to build buildings. You know, we don't just accidentally build buildings. And through much of human experience, that's the way things are ordered, but not in a battlefield, because battlefields are notorious for their chaos. So in a battlefield, you, you ex sort of expose this more primitive level. In a battlefield, an individual only knows what's going on right around him. And he only has very simple stimuli like an, a termite or an ant would have and very simple reactions that he can do to those stimuli. So the systems are actually very similar. But that's, you know, if you, if you look at movies uh, depicting Greek warfare, you know, it's uh, Leonidas at the gates of Thermopylae or, or uh, Achilles at, at the walls of Troy. And, and it's, it's, it's always massed phalanxes of, of, of armored warriors and, and uh, charging in, in very, very uh, what seems to be very ordered formations. But now you're telling me that's, 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 not, that's not the case? I mean, yeah, actually, the, yeah. the notion of the ordered charge that you see, like we would have in, in a, sort of the Napoleonic era, where they marched slowly in lockstep to battle, was completely alien to most of the Greeks. In fact, we know this to be the case because they were very particular about writing about the only group that could do this was Spartans, because Spartans, as a city-state, were considered to be masters of war. And if there was any aspect of warfare that could be done better, they were the ones doing it better. But most Greeks, what they did is they came to the battlefield as tribal units. So I was a member of this tribe, and you know, the, the bigger men in my tribe would go to the front of the unit. The you know, poorer guys who had less be better equipment would be in the back of the unit. And they would just come together in mass and charge at the exact equivalent on the opposite side of the field. Now, this charge to the opposite side of the field was not an orderly lockstep charge. You know, there was probably a lot of chaos in that. But what saved them is that they were originally lined up in an ordered manner. And the enemies were lined up in an ordered manner. So there's only so much chaos that can ensue when you're originally ordered up in, a, in an ordered manner and you're encountering another ordered unit. So as the, the charge occurs, chaos starts to build. But before things get really out of hand, you encounter the other unit. And encountering the other unit opposite imparts order because you have a front forming. So tell us how these warriors were equipped, because because uh, you know you know we, we we can't get that image out of our head of the of, of the Greek phalanx. So 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 tell us about their equipment, how they were outfitted, uh, 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 those sorts of things, yeah. and and uh, uh, that had some influence on how they actually formed into ranks. Yeah, didn't it? yeah, it's it's actually very interesting because the the Greek warriors were called hoplites, and hoplite pretty much just means a well-equipped man. So uh, a hoplon is a piece of equipment, an equipment for war. Um, and it's sort of an ironic semantic twist. One of the ancient writers talks about 
why they were called hoplites, and he said they were called hoplites because of their aspis. Now, the aspis is their shield. So the only thing that was important to ancient Greeks for a man to be considered one of their heavy warriors was that he had a shield. And we see this reinforced again and again. If you are a coward and you flee battle, you were called a rip aspist, someone who throws their shield away. Uh, you've probably heard the famous Spartan saying where as the men are going to war, the mother says, come back with this in your hand or come back on this dead with your friends carrying you. And the reason is the shield is what allowed them to form these units. The shield was a meter wide and it formed a literal meter stick for them to set up these ordered ranks. And the shield allowed them to fight as a cohesive unit because shields could be ranked against each other, shields could overlap, shields would protect the men beside you. And uh, I think we'll probably get into this a little later, but the shield had a very special function as well in uh, how warfare really was played out on, the, on these battlefields. So uh, they, 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 they had the shield and, and, and they held it up uh, supposedly strapped to their forearm with a handle and, mm -hmm. and then they were also carrying a weapon. And, and there are some myths that have, well, maybe not some myths, but some standard historical stories uh, about, about how these Greek warriors formed and how they fought and how they held their weapons. And, and one of the things that has come out of your work, actually, is that, is that maybe those historians mm -hmm. and archaeologists have all been wrong. Well, one of, one of the things that got me into this, uh, into studying this on the level of an academic, is that I was looking at the, the prevailing theories on how Greeks fought. And to put it into a nutshell, there's a, uh, there's a battle over how ancient Greeks fought. One side of the battle believes that they fought in a more open style with lots of uh, moving around between men and lots of room to fight with swords or fight with spears. The other side believes that they fought in a very dense uh, closed rank system where fighting with weapons was actually secondary to pushing against the other army, shield to shield, and a mass. And I was sympathetic to this second notion, this, this, this notion that they're pushing in mass. But I looked at the mechanics that were being held up for that system, and I realized they were flawed. Probably it's a failing of our educational system because most historians don't have extensive training in physics. So it's easy to see how you would misunderstand what's going on. When the, these authors would talk about it, they would have the men stand sideways like this, with the shield over their shoulder, actually inside the shield, and they would push through the shoulder. And that works great if I were pushing you. It falls apart if there are 10 people behind me pushing on me. And when that occurs, everything has to change. Pushing sideways is not stable anymore. If I'm being pushed from behind, the only thing that keeps me sideways is the strength of my tricep holding my shield out. I collapse into my shield when I'm pushed from behind. And then that can actually kill your troops, right? Yeah. yeah. The problem is once you collapse in like this, if you take the idea that they're pushing and push it to its eventual end result, you get a crowd of men, and a crowd of men at this density is lethal. So uh, this idea of a, a, of a mass charge, we'll come back to this in more detail in a moment, this, this, this ideal of a mass charge of this mass of men rushing forward at high speed towards an opposing phalanx uh, uh, probably would end up killing your own troops rather yeah. than, than anything else. It would probably end up, you'd probably end up impaling yourself on the enemy's spears. And the other problem with it is it was raised as an idea to maximize the force imparted when you collided. But in fact, it doesn't. It, it does the reverse. It's easy to see if you think about a handful of buckshot or BBs being thrown at a wall as opposed to a solid weight of that same mass. The, when you deal with a group of people, the important thing is not the number of people or how fast they're going. It's how tightly they are packed together. Because a series of impacts is always weaker than one solid impact. Okay, hold that thought. This is Conversations. We'll be back in a moment with Paul Bardunius. Welcome back to Conversations. Our guest today is Paul Bardunias, entomologist and historian. 
So, Paul, in the last segment, we were uh, talking about uh, the 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 physics of crowds and how that undermines this 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 classical idea from historians and archaeologists for how how uh, swarms of Greek warriors behaved. And and there's an actual science of crowds there, isn't there? Uh, you know, and that seems to have been an important part of, of, of your thinking about maybe the historians were wrong all along. Yeah, and I think that, that points out a, a failing in a lot of fields, is that we are afraid to look for evidence from other fields. And um, when I first realized that, that the model that was being put forth, there were flaws in it, and I had to understand what was actually happening. Once, the, once you realize that these are, in fact, crowds, then there's a lot of work that's been done on crowds, because uh, crowd uh, catastrophes are, are common, and of course, they're very lethal. So we can look at crowds, and we can find out exactly how much pressure they can exert uh, when you get a crowd of men pushing another crowd of men. And it turns out it's quite a lot. You can have a very short uh, line of men but if they're leaning against each other, just leaning forward against the back of the man in front of you, you can transfer something like 30 to 70 percent of your weight, depending on how you're leaning on the man in front of you. In these crowd densities, the mass becomes almost like a fluid, and you get waves of pressure that move through. These waves are enough to pull people off their feet in rock concerts, for instance. Um, one of the famous places you get these crowd disasters is actually circling the, the stone at Mecca. There's a lot of work been done on that because it, it's lethal. Um, of course, uh, you know, exits of soccer games and things like this is another place you get to get crushes. And when these things happen, you, you can get a lot of pressure in a very short distance, and it doesn't take all that much pressure to kill a man. Going back to the Greeks, one of the challenges is, well, okay, now we have this crowd and it's lethal. How did the Greeks survive this? Why would they do something that would be so lethal? And I think the secret to that goes back to the shield that we talked about in the last segment. The shield was round and deep. And the round, deep shield sat right across the chest like this and across the thighs. So they held the shield like this yep. rather than like this. Yeah, so instead okay. of off mm -hmm. to the side, right. you'd hold it around the front. Mm -hmm. And the way the shield was designed, the center of the shield was on your arm. So a lot of the shield was hanging off the side here, largely useless. But the important thing was that diameter of the shield and that it had to cover from here to your thighs. Because the rim would rest on the upper part of your chest, which is incompressible and on your thighs, which of course are incompressible. And it would protect your diaphragm and the middle of your body, which is what kills you when you're caught in a crowd and crush. You're asphyxiated by pressure on your diaphragm. It provides a kind of a bubble, basically, within yeah. this, within this uh, teeming fluid mass of people, yeah. then, basically. Okay. I, right. I've uh, likened it yeah. to a life preserver, because uh -huh. okay. uh, it is in a sense. And the thing about it is you don't need the life preserver every battle. So it's possible that they didn't fight every battle exactly the same way. But if there was even a possibility you couldn't get rid of the shield because then you would be the one who died. So th this 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 idea that that uh, um, that that you had this uh, set of equipment that that uh, that helped uh, warriors exploit the physics of crowds effectively that had to have come from something and it had to have evolved from something uh, uh, supposedly and 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 uh, the style of, of warfare amongst uh, amongst uh, uh, Greek uh, farmers and and, uh, and and those kinds of people when they when they when they went to war um, uh, they didn't have this kind of equipment and 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 uh, presumably they were experiencing sure. the kind of crushing forces that that that, that crowds that uh, you find in soccer stadiums do. Right. Yeah. Well, all all groups of men that come into contact at this close combat level will encounter this. For instance, we know of cases where Romans were fighting with very different equipment and they got into these presses. The difference is when you get into this press, one of the things that happens is the men who are being squashed push back. And there's no intention to kill your own men. So if the men in front of you are pushing back against you, you'll loosen up. There has to be a concerted effort to keep this crowd pressure going in a, in a Greek phalanx as opposed to a mass of hundreds of people. And so that's sort of where it, where it breaks down. Early on, there, there would have been these things, but they would have been incidental. It was only understanding that these incidental forces were occurring and harnessing them that allowed this phalanx combat to occur the way it did. 
So you liken the behavior of these of these Greek uh, Greek uh, uh, troops to self-organization, the the kinds of behaviors you get in in uh, swarms of bees and ants and sure. uh, those kinds of creatures. But you know, self-organization is kind of a broader phenomenon as well. You know, you know. So so um, uh, you know to. To liken the Greeks to a self-organized group is 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 to kind of uh, 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 build them into a continuum of physical phenomena that are built around this label of self-organization. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, what the elements of self-organization are, and then we'll start to explore maybe ways that Greek armies aren't like that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll say first that getting historians to understand the self-organization is is a real task. And the, the, some of the biggest stumbling blocks have been with military men, because military men have spent their whole career avoiding the kinds of things that happen in self-organization. And I, I, I have an anecdote that's kind of, kind of funny in that I was explaining this to somebody who was a military man, and he was sure this could not occur. These forces could not have been what happened. And in his experience, he told me that you couldn't start a charge against an enemy without severe, strong, top-down control, because too much stuff had to be coordinated from the top down. And he went through and he talked about all the different elements that have to be done. The men have to line up. The men have to point towards the enemy in unison. They have to step off in unison. And the whole discussion went on like that. And then I asked him, who gives the order to run away? And it ended the discussion because running away from the battlefield is obviously self-organized. And if running away from the battlefield is self-organized, so same principles can also occur in charging into the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at just the phenomenon of self-organization, we have a situation where you have local information. That's the key to self-organization. The individual who is part of the self-organized mass, be it an insect or a human, can only have a small piece of the greater puzzle known to them. They have a stimulus that comes in and they can respond to that stimulus. It's the, sort of the chain of stimulus and response that's important in self-organization. The classic example of a self-organized event is what they call a Mexican wave at a football game. You know, where you stand up and it goes around the whole stadium. Well, you don't have to watch the wave coming and predict when you stand up. You don't need that kind of information. All you need to know is when this guy next to me stands up, I stand up. And you get this beautiful coordinated movement that is dri driven by simply knowing when the guy next to me stands up. But still, you know, you, you know, you can you can you can talk about self-organization uh, all you want and 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 liken them to bees. But 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 any mob is going to be self-organized. And one of the things that you see in the history of warfare is that is that is that somehow uh, great tacticians and great generals actually emerge uh, yeah. uh, uh, from this. And 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 so you're you're there's an interesting dilemma. It seems that your military man is, in a sense, correct. That is, you need some kind of command, some kind of top-down command, to to impose some kind of order on this chaotic mass of people. Mm -hmm. uh, is that really what the Greeks did? See, that's why the Greeks are such an interesting example, because in later warfare, in early modern warfare, there was a lot of top-down control, strict ranks and generals giving commands to under officers. That's another thing. The Greeks are a fascinating example because. Almost all of the order was imparted before they went to battle. So the great Greek generals were like chess players. They didn't command while the battles were going on to any great extent. They were in the battle, actually. So the famous Greek generals were in the ranks with the men. And if they shouted an order, it could only be heard by the men right around them. So what was most important for the Greek generals was how they dispositioned the troops before. And it's that initial ordering that is the key to uh, the tactician uh, a success in the Greek system. Hold that thought. We'll come back in a moment. This is Conversations with Paul Bardunias. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Conversations with Paul Bardunias. Paul, in the last segment, we were talking about the very different role of generals in in um, in, in Greek warfare as opposed to our modern conception mm -hmm. of generals. In our modern conception, the general is sitting in a command headquarters someplace you know, remote from the battle, whereas in the kind of Greek uh, uh, kind of a system, uh, uh, you had the general right there. It was the general who was the first, basically, in line to, to, to face the uh, enemy. And in, in social insects, that, that that parallels kind of an interesting dilemma in social insects, you know, and and uh, we tend to think of social insects as 
as being uh, swarms of more or less identical robots. Mm -hmm. Again, only aware of little things around them, you know, uh, behavior determined in a funny way by whoever is, is, is closest to you in a chain of information flow through, the, through this mob. But when you get to that, when you watch how that happens in actual social insects, um, you find that those kinds of things don't really accomplish very much. They have to be directed somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, one of the common things in social insects, for example, is that, is that if you take a bunch of ants or bees and you put them in, or termites and you put them into a dish, they eventually end up just kind of sitting there and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, amongst those kinds of swarms, uh, uh, there's almost always an idiosyncratic individual in yeah. there that actually gets things going. And, 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 so, and so is that kind of a similar thing to what you are saying that happened with the Greek? Well, uh, style this is of actually warfare? something I've, I've worked with mm -hmm. the, uh, pretty extensively with termites. Yeah. So not with the Greeks, but with, with termites. I work on tunneling in termites and how termites come together in, in small groups to dig tunnels. Well, one of the things that came out of it pretty quick is that not all termites are equal when it comes to digging tunnels. And on average, about 15% of the, the termites in any group are actually doing almost all of the work. So you have this, this clique of what, the, what would be called key individuals who are actually doing most of the work. And whether they have a, some better template for what the end result should look like or not is, is almost irrelevant because it's, it's their labor that is driving it. So for instance, I know uh, of a case we had where we were watching them tunnel. And one individual dominated the tunnel and did a lot of work but it turned the tunnel to the right, completely turned the tunnel. After it left, they filled that tunnel in and started back on the direction they were originally. So you have these, these individuals who are doing a lot of, of work and dominating the system, but it's not always driving the system. Sometimes it's actually adding, adding chaos to it. Now, in the, in the sense of uh, ancient Greek warfare, um, they're, they're, they went to great lengths to not let that happen. There are a number of times where an individual would fight as an individual. So you'd have an individual who would go out in front of the army and try to fight as a, you know, a forefright fighter. Usually, they were slapped down because even though they did an heroic action, um, they put everybody else at jeopardy. Wasn't that the story of Achilles out there? In a sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the heart of it. And that's, that to me is fascinating because it shows, if not a conscious understanding, sort of a group awareness of the need for this cohesion that causes the self-organization. So this goes to the goes to the question of of, of, of why these groups of, of of Greek warriors went to war in the first place. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a there's a very uh, a prominent historian of, of of ancient Greek warfare, Victor Davis Hanson, who 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 makes the very telling point that that these weren't just warriors; they were farmers, they were agronomists, they were a, an agrarian people. And yet they still went to war periodically. Yeah. And somehow the structure of command w t was built upon that. But why did they go to war in the first place? Well, and what determined how they went to war? Yeah, that's actually a difficult question, Why exactly yeah. why they went to war. You know, part of going to war for the Greeks surely was this, this sense of agonism, this sense of simply uh, competing with the other cities. So you would have your group of, of citizen farmers and they would have their group of citizen farmers and you would compete and actually what's interesting is when my group of citizen farmers attacked your group one of the things we attacked was your farm so we didn't take your city and enslave you we cut down all your olive trees so it's a very interesting to see what the target of the aggression was as well but the the contest between cities surely was one way of building the civic spirit that enabled these farmers to work together so it allowed you to be part of a team and it allowed you also to prove to all of your neighbors that you were willing to fight for the community. And that's probably the primary reason why these people went to war. We see the bigger wars happen over trade disputes and the same kind of things we have in modern warfare. But the sort of smaller disputes that were happening in the background between smaller states the whole time, you know, they were not much more than raids on the other uh, city for cattle or raids on the agricultural produce of the other city and fighting at the borders. Um, a lot of these things were simply border skirmishes just to keep the, the men occupied and to uh, allow them to show off. Uh, so, okay, so, uh, so that's a really interesting uh, irrational basis for going to war. Uh, 
uh, and I'm sitting here reflecting on, on, on the ways that other, other cultures uh, sort of evolved in parallel with this. Uh, you know the 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 uh, Bantu tribes of southern Africa, for example. You know, you know they 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 went through a similar evolution of of, of warfare tactics, starting off with skirmishes of of small groups of people, uh, throwing things at each other. Very few people would get hurt. You know, a lot of noise and fury, and then everyone would go home. But the thing that 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 drove that that competition was basically. Uh, looking for cattle for lobola for mm. bride price basically and 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 so that's kind of <coughs> the same thing that went on in Greece then. Yes, some of the early myths are almost exactly that. They are mm. they are squabbles over cattle, yeah. and surely in the in the heroic age early on, a lot of it was simply that it was squabbles over cattle for brides, or most likely squabbles over the brides themselves. So a lot of the famous myths are the taking of someone's sister for a bride and then the brothers coming back to get that bride price from you. Yeah. And, and the, the, the other interesting parallel is, is that of course in, in, the, in the Southern African culture, uh, uh, you also had this, this, this tendency for relatively ragtag groups of people to start organizing into uniformly equipped uh, impies, uh, 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 troops of, of warriors. But at the center of this was always a charismatic individual who, who, who could actually mobilize this. In the case of the Zulu, of course, it was Shaka. In the case of, of, uh, of, of the Spartans, I mm. suppose it was Leonidas, although you could tell us more about that. Yeah, but, that but happened far earlier, but yeah. Far earlier, yeah. okay. But, but again, you come back to this basic tension between, between having uh, self-organized things, mobs of warriors behaving like ants versus having a charismatic individual that comes in. And so, mm -hmm. in what sense is that self-organized? Well, the difference is the charismatic individual is usually changing the equipment or the, the organization at a higher level. He's not changing what happens on the battlefield. He's changing, again, that set piece before. So, if you are Shaka Zulu, you don't have to tell your men exactly how to fight in the battlefield because you're going to give them a half-size spear and it's pretty obvious how they're going to fight on the battlefield. So tactics evolve from the weapons, but the big men are the ones who institute these, these changes because they can. You have to convince somebody to attack with a short spear because it's a lot safer to attack by throwing something from far away. Yeah. 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 Well, we could carry this on forever. It's an endless source of fascination, but uh, we're at the end of our time. Uh, Paul, thank you for visiting us here at ESF. You're welcome. Thank you. For Conversations, uh, I'm Scott Turner, wishing you a good day. Thank you.